This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, executive editor of the Breakthroughs newsletter. Coffee is one of the most popular beverages in the world. Hot or cold, flavored or black, about 64% of Americans say they drink a cup every day. The caffeine found in coffee is a big draw, of course, but the flavor, aroma, and social or cultural ties to coffee also keep many people coming back for more. So how much coffee is too much? And is it a healthy habit or a vice? And why can some people drink coffee all day with little consequence, while others get jittery after a cup? Dr. Marilyn Cornelis studies the genetics of coffee consumption, caffeine metabolism, and taste preferences. She's an assistant professor of preventive medicine in the Division of Nutrition here at Feinberg, and has some new findings to share about coffee drinkers, genetics, and health. Welcome to Breakthroughs. Thank you, Erin. So the first question is, how do you take your coffee? I add a little bit of artificial sweetener, and a little cream. So your background is in nutrition, but you're studying coffee pretty exclusively. How did you get into this topic area? It was actually part of my uh, PhD um, training, I guess. After I finished my um, undergrad in nutrition at Ryerson University, I that's in Toronto, I um, began my uh, master's, which, which um, we switched up to a PhD program. And it was kind of a project that was given to me by my supervisor. Um, we were interested in looking at coffee and heart disease, and um, we were interested in incorporating genetics. And so we looked at the pathway related to, say, caffeine metabolism, and we knew that there was a key gene that was involved in about 95% of caffeine metabolism. So that, well, let's take a look at that gene and see if genetic variation in that, in that enzyme modifies our response to coffee in terms of risk of heart disease. And we were just focusing on one gene at the time. And we found that individuals with a particular variant related to increased caffeine metabolism, we found no significant risk of heart attacks, or as used, myocardial infarction. But we found no significant risk of heart of a heart attack with coffee consumption. However, those with a genetic variant related to impaired caffeine metabolism, so more caffeine lingers on the system, we found an increased risk with already two two or more cups per day. And that was just one variant at the time. And since then, when I began my postdoc at um, Harvard School of Public Health, um, new technology arised, and there was our ability to conduct genome-wide analysis of um, various traits. And obviously, people were interested in the disease at the time, but because I had a passion for coffee research, I thought, there's got to be variants related to coffee consumption. And so using thousands and thousands of people, um, we were able to use this high-throughput omic technology to find or discover new variants or genetic variants related to coffee consumption. And we, up, up until around now, we've identified maybe a handful of genes. And among those genes are the very gene that I have researched as a, um, as a student like 10 years ago. So at that time, we were kind of on, on, on the cusp on, of something, on the cusp something, right? But it was cool about caffeine is that we actually know quite a bit about its metabolism. It's the most widely consumed psychostimulant in the world. Um, and so people are obviously interested in studying it. And it's kind of a, because it's in our coffee, it's relatively safe pro, our compound to be studying in humans. The ability to metabolize caffeine can vary between almost 6 and 20 hours between individuals. We know that there are a number of factors beyond genetics that, that change our ability to metabolize caffeine. One key risk, risk factor for multiple genes or multiple outcomes is smoking. We know smoking induces or increases the activity of, of CYP1A2. Sorry, I didn't mention that the gene, but that's the key gene involved in caffeine metabolism. It actually induces that gene and increases activity. And so smokers actually metabolize caffeine very quickly. And it has a very potent effect. And although you always correlate smokers with heavy coffee consumption, although there is a behavioral correlation there, there's also a biological connection as well because they're metabolizing it so quickly that in order to maintain that psychostimulant effect, they need to consume more. And that's kind of where the genes come in, too. We find that um, in the, the genome-wide uh, analysis studies that are done with coffee consumption behavior, we found that people who have these variants related to increased caffeine metabolism, they also consume more coffee. And on a side note, I've also done studies looking at actual circulating levels of caffeine in the blood. And we find that the same variants that lead to um, increased caffeine metabolism lead to lower levels of caffeine in the blood. So basically, we're kind of titrating our um, consumption habits 
so that we're kind of maintaining the optimal effects that we we anticipate from caffeine. Sort of a self-regulation of our exactly. coffee and yeah. caffeine intake. Exactly. And that's only through genetics. And it's using, you know, we're looking at thousands of, of gene, genetic variants. And it's amazing how they kind of all fall on the pathway we anticipate. Yet it was largely a discovery or hypo- a non-hypothesized non-hypoth- kind of research that we're conducting. You know, what's funny, people can now take those 23andMe, other DNA tests, and it, and it tells them if they have certain variants. I actually saw your name listed on the 23andMe test as one of the studies that they're using. The paper that they always cite is the, the JAMA article, where the, the work that I just described as a PhD student. And that's just looking at heart disease. And it's unfortunate that they only include that particular study um, because um, coffee is contains numerous compounds. And... It might impact diseases in different ways. A great example that I talk about is Parkinson's disease. There's pretty strong evidence linking coffee to a reduction in, in risk of Parkinson's disease. And experimental data suggests that it's potentially the caffeine component that's protective. And so really to um, use my one study in 23andMe as kind of a, a guideline as in you shouldn't be consuming this much coffee because your heart, your risk of heart disease will increase. But what about other diseases? If I had a strong family history of Parkinson's disease, I wouldn't cut back on coffee necessarily because there's strong evidence sh- suggesting that caffeine might be protective. But for someone that might have a, um, a, a strong history of heart disease, it could be a different different recommendation. That's why it's a little difficult with, with coffee. Or even caffeine. And another reason to kind of take some of those results with a grain of salt when you're doing the at-home right. DNA kits that are talking about these traits, because you still have some work to do here. Right, right. And obviously, um, much of my work is focused on the, the caffeine component of coffee, but um, it contains a number, of, a number of compounds, which I just mentioned that it's a kind of a mixed bag of, of goodies. Um, well, I consider goodies. But another example would be the chlorogenic acid, which is found in coffee. And What's interesting in terms of the diabetes research, which is also linked coffee to reduction in type 2 diabetes, is that we're, um, in the population studies, we find that both decaf and regular coffee are associated with a reduction in type 2 diabetes. That might suggest that it's something besides caffeine, and chlorogenic acid is one potential candidate that might be kind of driving this protective association because chlorogenic, chlorogenic acid might have benefits on glucose um, metabolism. You've mentioned Parkinson's disease, type 2 diabetes, um, heart disease. What other diseases have been looked at in the literature with that sort of coffee connection, either a protective or maybe something detrimental? Cancers have been um, of interest. It's kind of inconsistent with, with cancers. I've also done work with mortality, which um, I published a couple um, a, a couple months ago with, my, uh, with, a, with a, some collaborators from NCI. We reported that coffee is associated with reduction in mortality. And that was also based on a very large population of over 400,000 people. It was, it was pretty, pretty strong and convincing. And in that particular study, we had the opportunity of looking at different types of coffee, um, decaf, obviously, but also instant coffee and regular coffee. We found pretty much the same patterns of reduction in mortality. That particular paper made a bit of a splash in the media and with the general public because it made people feel a little better if they were drinking coffee, that maybe it wasn't a bad thing. Because I think there's some people have an idea, I need to cut back on my coffee. I'm drinking too much coffee. Years back, coffee had kind of a bad rep. Um, Even physicians would, you know, even without the strong literature, they would say that you should cut back on your coffee. If you're hypertension, hypertension, cut back. The, The grounding for that advice was really wasn't there. And I think in the past five, five, ten years, we're kind of learning more about coffee and that maybe it's not as bad as we thought it was. People often correlate heavy coffee consumption with stress and sitting at the desk for too long, no exercise. Maybe it's those factors. Those are what we call, us epidemiolog- epidemiologists call confounders. And maybe it was those things that um, kind of um, correlate with coffee, suggesting that might have an adverse effect on health. But we're not seeing those relationships. We've been doing the doing the science a little better now. You work with a lot of physicians. Do they say that they're using your research in the clinic with patients? I know that their patients have concerns about, you know, should I cut back? It's never, should I increase my intake? Obviously, a physician would never ask anyone to up their intake because um, what's interesting, as, as we talked about how we kind of self-titrate caffeine levels, that, that's kind of a good thing. It helps protect us from 
potentially adverse acute effects of caffeine. And um, I think one, um, one very common um, acute effect of coffee for some individuals or even caffeine is heart palpations. And those are the things that physicians constantly think about, and those are the acute effects. But the long-term habitual um, effects that coffee has on health, it's, it seems to be very different from acute. Like, if we were to have trans or kind of extrapolated everything we knew about the acute effects of caffeine on um, health, we probably wouldn't have found what, we, what we're now finding with type 2 diabetes because caffeine actually has acute adverse impact on glucose levels. But over time, coffee, I, I'm going to stress coffee again because there's other things in coffee. Sure. We're seeing other things. We're actually seeing potential benefits on the glucose regulation. So the acute and chronic effects of, of diet um, and coffee in particular is very quite different. There was another paper recently that talked about the coffee cannabis connection. Um, earlier this year, you published in the Journal of Internal Medicine about how coffee affects metabolism, including the metabolism of steroids and the neurotransmitters typically linked to cannabis. Tell me more about this finding. Yeah, this is actually um, kind of a new area I'm getting into, obviously extending some of my coffee work. Um, besides genetics, we have what we call metabolomics, and it allows us to kind of take a snapshot of all the metabolites in your blood and um, how they might uh, respond to certain exposures. And for this particular study, I had the great opportunity of collaborating with a group in Finland who had already conducted a coffee trial. And they basically asked um, around, it's a small trial, but this is typical because trials are smaller. They asked 46 men and women to abstain from coffee for a month. Then they were asked to consume four cups of coffee per day for a month. And then they were asked to consume eight cups per day for a month. Um, eight cups a day seems like it's a lot, but this is actually conducted in Finland where the average is about four cups per day. So it was only doubling their intake. Not a big deal. No big deal for right, them. Right, right. After each of those trial periods, we took a, a blood sample. And then um, I had the, uh, I kind of contacted the PI and said, do you guys have any samples left over? And so they, sh they sent them over here and we profiled them. And we basically looked at a, just over 700 metabolites kind of circulating in the blood and looked at their impact on the coffee response based on the trial. And we found what we expected. First of all, the caffeine metabolites went up for the, uh, the, for the periods where they consume coffee. That's good. That's kind of a positive signal suggesting that, okay, we're finding stuff. But then some other interesting metabolites came up as well. The more interesting ones are the ones that actually um, went down with coffee consumption. We know that, um, as I mentioned, coffee is kind of a plant and has a number of compounds. And the chemicals are the metabolites that were linked to the actual coffee itself, those went up and those were expected. So derivatives of chlorogenic acid, those went up. Mm -hmm. Again, those are positive, um, positive signals. But we found these metabolites that were similar to the endocannabinoids or the, the cannabinoids which we, that we linked to cannabis. We found that the levels of the endocannabinoids, which our body produces naturally, they actually went down. Um, usually when you um, use cannabis, those um, cannabinoids kind of go up. And we found the opposite. And um, it's amazing. What we, what we know about the endocannabinoid system is largely um, taken from the cannabis research. But here we find that coffee consumption and uh, another external kind of exposure, we find that these, the levels go down. And I, I, it took me a while to wrap my, my head around this because obviously I do coffee research. I Suddenly now I have to be an expert in cannabis. <laughs> right. So obviously I reached out to people who actually sure. do the research. Obviously they do it. So it's like... Um, I don't want to pretend I know anything about cannabis when I don't. And what they had said originally is that um, typically endocannabinoids, they go down in response to stress. And so uh, it, this what we, were sh what we were seeing might just actually be kind of a short-term effect that coffee might be having, that your body is kind of under some stress and that your body is trying to get back. Hmm. Um, to um, a non-stress state, yeah. and that's what um, the endocannabinoids might be doing. Uh, regardless, it's just interesting how we find the it's the opposite of what typically you see with cannabis. And another um, important implication of this is that, um, obviously, with all the, the changes in guidelines for cannabis use these days, uh, we know that coffee is one of the most widely consumed beverages, and very likely that people that are using cannabis might be consuming coffee. And so people or the reporters that were very interested in this were thinking, so what's going to happen? Are they right, counteract When they drink the coffee and they are right, indulging in cannabis, yeah. what, is their body going to respond? I don't know. And it's a good way? question. Yeah. I'm not, and I'm hoping to um, kind of delve into that research in particular because we want to know those if there's interactions. Um, 
currently much of what we know about a cannabis has been um, just focus on cannabis itself. In trials, obviously, they're going to be controlling all those things. And another thing is that, you know, caffeine, well, there's literature suggesting that caffeine has benefits on, on memory and cognitive function, very opposite of what mm. we see with cannabis. And so I'm kind of thinking it'd be very interesting if, if at the end of the day we find that cannabis is, is useful in the medical, are, medical arena, then maybe um, using it in conjunction with, say, coffee, might kind of cancel out the yeah. adverse effects. We know there is pretty com convincing evidence suggesting that cannabis isn't so great for your memory. And while yeah. it might be um, great for pain, we're, you know, you have to deal with these other side effects. Yeah. So if we could find ways to kind counteract. of counteract, that'd be great. Um, these are obviously just ideas that I r I'm really interested in exploring. Have you started any new projects with on this topic? More discussions. I know there's a group in California that has kind of a center um, dedicated to cannabis research. So I kind of reached out to them and said, have you guys even thought of asking your um, patients uh, um, prior to some of your interventions if they consume coffee? No, oh, no, we've never thought about that, but we'll, we'll discuss it. And so also I've reached out to um, a psychiatrist here at uh, Northwestern who does cannabis and also opioid research. And I thought, you know, I would love to collaborate with you and kind of think about some of these ideas. Because obviously as, as a non-cannabis researcher, i um, I don't want to um, be trying to reinvent the wheel. And also just adding to um, the implications of it. Out of that research, I, I, an interviewer had um, kind of wanted to talk to me because in New York, I guess, uh, what they're doing in some of these um, kind of shops is they're adding um, CBD oil. So not the cannabis. Uh, cannabis obviously has the, um, the THC component, which yes. is what people link to classic um, cognitive function differences. But CBD or cannabinoid, oil component of cannabis has probably different effects. And what they're doing in these coffee shops is they're actually adding cannabinoid oil to coffee. I'm not sure if that could be how regulated that is, but... They're doing it. Yeah, yeah, and they're selling it. So, um, and still, we don't know what the consequences yeah. of that combination is. It sounds like you're able to reach out to people all over the world to conduct this research. Tell me about that. The, how easy is it for you to call up someone in California or Finland and, and get involved with their studies? With the new technology, like the, the genome-wide scan data that I've been doing when I was as a postdoc at Harvard, these genetic studies require a lot of power in order to get that power you need large sample sizes and so you reach out to collaborators who have um, a lot of genetic data on people as well as information on coffee intake and obviously you you kind of pitch the story to them okay coffee is important and we need to do this kind of research and so I've been very lucky to have a lot of research support it's a lot of a lot of um, effort on the part on the part of people who are kind of focused on other research but they're contributing and Basically, what you end up with are papers with thousands of, or not thousands, but a lot of, of authors on there. But we're all kind of meeting towards an end that we're kind of interested in the role that genetics play in not only disease, but also our responses to lifestyle factors, one of which is coffee. And obviously, I've contributed to some of their research, which is not coffee related, but, mm -hmm. you know, it. everyone kind of gives and takes. And that's what's great about the genetic kind of um, area of research is that we all know that we need the numbers yeah. and we kind of help each other. And right now, most of the people whose genomes and that you're studying are of European descent. Um, is there plans to move into other data sets? I know some people maybe of Asian descent you're looking at as well. Yeah, this, these are great questions because um, obviously the kind of some of the details is that some of these genetic variants, the frequency of these kind of vary by population and whether the same um, findings that we have can um, be extrapolated to say Asians or, or other ancestries is an open question. There are some kinds of preliminary data suggesting that they do, but but these are something we need to specifically examine. And what's interesting with um, blacks in particular, there's a, a pretty consistent pattern that blacks tend to consume less coffee than than whites. It's interesting, and um, I have to I, I had plans to look at this to see maybe that it could be just the 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 prevalence of these genetic factors. Yeah. Uh, related to coffee consumption behavior are just different across these populations, but it's interesting. And um, we also know there's some um, some disparities in health outcomes across um, across populations, and our department is really very interested in health disparities, and it'd be very interesting to see if, if maybe genetics or just differences in dietary behaviors 
um, have a consequence on health outcomes and kind of explain some of those disparities. Sounds like you're just on the tip of the iceberg with some of this. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, coffee research. I, I'm guessing we're going to continue consuming coffee for the rest of uh, forever. So <laughs> might as well get to know a little bit better. Your latest study, most recent study, was published in Scientific Reports, and it had some surprising findings about people with high sensitivity to the bitter taste of caffeine actually drink more coffee. So this is one of those things where you think that doesn't really make sense, but this is what you found. Can you explain? Yeah, this is a great collaboration with a group in Australia who've actually done a lot of um, taste perception work, basically having thousands of people. This particular study was based on... um, or it was kind of derived from an earlier report that where they had um, thousands of twins come in. Twin twin research is just so powerful, and it's it's pretty pretty cool. But they've had these um, individuals come into kind of a lab, and they asked them to test solutions. And one of these solutions were um, a caffeine chemical compound. People can actually you know taste it's like a white bitter compound, okay. and they kind of rated the the bitter intensity of caffeine. And also other compounds, which were also included in that paper, it was PROP as well as quinine. And um, with that work, they identified variants that were related to the ability to perceive caffeine. And so we were finding, they, they reported this uh, finding, and they were thinking that, well, I wonder if these same variants are also related to coffee consumption behavior. You think that people were, who are very sensitive to caffeine, because it's very bitter, you think that if it's too bitter, we won't consume it. Because... Humans, um, humans naturally avoid bitter substances. It's kind of a, a cool um, response that we have. It helps us kind of um, stay away from harmful, poisonous mm-hmm. things because back in the day we didn't know, you know, we might stumble across a berry. Think, I'm kind of hungry. I might have that, but it might not be good for you. So you consume it. It's bitter, so you won't eat it. And so that's that kind of um, human innate kind of um, response. But it was very interesting with this study. We found that the variant, the genetic variants that were related to Um, increased caffeine sensitivity so they could actually detect caffeine much better, it was actually linked to increased coffee consumption. And so we interpreted this as a potential learning, um, a learning behavior that um, most people are well aware of the effects that caffeine has. So if in their mind they can perceive caffeine is in the coffee, then maybe they'll consume more because you want to get that kick. That's how we interpreted it. Um, More research is necessary. Um, and also adding to that potential interpretation is that um, the other the variants related to other bitter compounds, not caffeine, um, they were related to reduction in coffee consumption. So people who were um, that could uh, perceive the bitterness of another very bitter compound avoided coffee. So, so it's a ob- learned thing, maybe that we're- yeah, <laughs> or that particular those particular variants were really capturing the real bitterness of coffee, and that was just something that they really avoided. So they avoided coffee consumption. And what's the been the reaction to that paper? Oh, yeah, there's been a lot of... I was actually quite surprised at the attention. And honestly, I'm not even the course buying author. So I'm sure in Australia, they're getting like double the amount of, of attention. Um, it just goes to, to tell you that there's great interest in in not only just the health um, implications of, of coffee consumption, just why we consume it. Why are we obsessed with it? Um uh, if you ask um, someone why they consume coffee, that you know, that could be because of the taste, or a lot of people won't admit that. You know, I'm kind of addicted to it, and I kind of like this. Like this. I don't like the taste of it. I just consume it. I bury the uh, bury the taste with yeah. with other things. And you know, we know at Starbucks they able to do that, right? They can ask sugar. Oh yes, or, cream. How would you like your coffee? Pumpkin Caramel? lattes. Right. <laughs> right. This isn't even coffee anymore. Um, but still, they're getting that caffeine kick. Um, yeah, and so in addition to um, the taste and even the psychostimulant effects, there's also the social aspects of it too, um, especially during the holidays. And um, I could, this morning, obviously, it was, it was kind of snowy, and so it was kind of nice to sit back and just sip a nice warm beverage. And obviously, genetic work and finding genetics related um, uh, related to coffee consumption, um, it can be challenged by those particular factors because those aren't always necessarily genetic. And so... That's, I, again, going back to how we need um, large sample sizes to kind of override that, that what we call noise into looking for a genetic factor related to taste and also uh, coffee consumption behavior. Out of the body of work you've created so far and that of your colleagues, what do you tell people when they ask about coffee consumption? How much should I be drinking? What do you say? Um, moderation. And actually, even consistent with the guidelines, and which have recently changed in light of all the research on coffee, 
if um, and the guidelines suggest that up to five cups of coffee per se is safe. They're not telling people to consume that much, but if you're already consuming that much and you have been for years, I wouldn't tell them don't. You need to cut back. Um, it seems to be pretty safe, and because we have this kind of self trade trading impact, um, if you're consuming too much coffee, you will naturally cut back because of the the symptoms that you might you might experience. So moderation. I wouldn't. Someone who's enjoying two cups a day, I wouldn't tell them, no, you need to cut back entirely. Um, I think, I think we're really different, really changing um, the way we provide guys uh, advice on on coffee these days. We're not telling people to go cold turkey. You know, two cups a day won't kill you. I, I don't think. I like in my that. opinion. I was actually looking at the National Coffee Association's website because they have all these stats about coffee. And um, they say that scientists or lab technicians are the heaviest self-reported coffee drinkers. So we're talking about your colleagues here. Yeah. (laughs) What do you think about that? Well, maybe that's why everyone's contributing to my work because they're wondering why they're consuming so much. (laughs) You know, the second most uh, heavily reported coffee, self-reported coffee drinkers were people in PR and marketing. So I can say that um, in my line of work, I see that as well. Do you drink coffee? I drink a lot of coffee. And yeah. when do you have your last cup of coffee? Um, I usually stop around noon. See, that's the funny thing because most people know exactly yeah. how much coffee they're consuming and when they consume it. It's all about self, self-regulation. self Thank you so much for coming today to talk about your research, and I'm excited to see what else you have in store. Great. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.